WNYC Studios. Note to Self is supported by Penguin Press, publisher of Irresistible, The Rise of Addictive Technology and the Business of Keeping Us Hooked by Adam Alter. There are an estimated 280 million smartphone addicts. Are you one of them? Find out more in Irresistible. Note to Self is supported by Squarespace, launching their new campaign, Make Your Next Move. Make your next move and set new goals this year. Lock down your next move idea with a unique domain and create a website to launch today. Use offer code NOTE for 10% off your first purchase of a Squarespace domain or website. Make your next move with Squarespace. More at squarespace.com. Hello, Note to Self listener. It is your host, Manoush. And the reason you're hearing this is because I'm... On vacation. Which means that what you're about to hear is an encore episode of Note to Self. A nice way of saying it's a repeat. But hey, we only re-release our absolute favorites. So please enjoy this episode again, or maybe enjoy it for the very first time if you're new to the show. And while you're here, please subscribe to Note to Self, because we'll be back with something brand new really soon. I'm Anoush Zamarodi, and on this week's show, a conversation that changed how I feel about snooping and surveillance. Because I don't know about you, but usually when I hear that the NSA is collecting my phone data or that BuzzFeed archives all my answers to their silly personality quizzes, what I really want to do is stick my fingers in my ears and go la 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 la, because what's the point of knowing if there's nothing we can do? Well, on this episode, a new perspective. Because getting the scary details can actually make us feel better. It's like if you were told that you have a disease, you would still want to know, right? Like, what does the research say? What's the prognosis? It's a way of having just a little control. What's that cliche? Knowledge is power. And in the past couple of weeks, I got numerous emails from you, listeners asking for help in understanding privacy and data better. You're going to hear some of those emails and voice memos that you sent in throughout the show. And thanks for those, by the way. Keep them coming. We love answering them. So to tutor us in privacy and data, I turned to a really nice guy. Some of you might have heard of him. Bruce Schneier. He's been writing about encryption since the 1990s. He's the author of about a dozen books, and man, does he have a hardcore following as one of the best cryptographers in the world. There are even Bruce Schneier fan t-shirts. You can go online and find them. But the best thing about Bruce is that he can talk about this stuff like a regular guy. And he's fun. He's fun about surveillance. And his new book is Data and Goliath the hidden battles to collect your data and control your world. And he's here in the studio with me. Hi, Bruce. Hey. Hi. Bruce, why should we give 9800 Savage Road, Columbia, Maryland as our address? I don't know if we all should. Uh, That is the address of the NSA, and I've always been doing that. (laughs) But Does anybody ever pick you up on that? Nobody knows what the NSA's address. If you give 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, you might get recognized as the White House. But I think if you stick with the NSA or maybe the CIA headquarters, I think you're safe. Okay, and to get more serious, what's the point of that? Why not give your own address? If I mean, I I don't know. I always feel bad when the clerk says to me, address and zip code, and I'm like, I don't want to give it to you. I, I just feel there's a weird social contract that I'm not meeting for some reason. Well, but that's the way it goes. We want to conform. We want to be nice to the person who's asking us the nice question. But you know, in the end, feeding more data into the database is uh, – I don't know if we should do that just without thinking. And my reflex is always when I ask information not to give it. And because of the social contract, as you said, it's much easier to give a fake address and to say I'm not giving my address. So giving fake information is often just easier. But even when there's not a person in front of you, one of the things that you recommend in your book is to do things like search for random names on Facebook. Explain seriously why you think this can make a difference. You know, it's arguable that it does make a difference. So you're being tracked on the internet and the things you search, and the things you read and the things you do are being used to compile a dossier. And if you add some fake information, then the dossier isn't as accurate and you have a little more privacy and anonymity. You're not going to spend your day searching for fake things on Google. It's a really kind of weird way to spend a day, although actually it might be kind of fun. I mean I've looked at random Wikipedia entries and it's an enjoyable half hour. But the more you do stuff like that, the less your profile – 
matches you. And that just feels feels more private to me. Yeah. Listener Rick Callaher, he's a photographer in Montauk, New York, and he wrote us a question. He said, I have covered many a corporate event where executives are extremely proud of the information they're able to glean, even from children, basically by inducing them to think it's a fun idea to participate and give up information. So, you know, and I think what Rick wants to know, and what I certainly want to know, is when is it good or helpful for companies to know about us, and when is it just too much? Where should we draw the line? It's really hard to know. I, mean, I actually like it when Amazon gives me books I might want to buy based on books I have bought. I've gotten some great books from new authors I hadn't heard of because of that, because if you like this, you might also like this. Right. On the other hand, I don't like the fact that Google knows what kind of porn every American likes. That feels kind of creepy. Now, somewhere in the middle is going to be the line. Now, Bruce, I want to just <laughs> read this crazy thing that you wrote, this example, that Facebook not only knows that women feel less attractive on Mondays, it also knows that they feel less attractive when they feel lonely, fat, or depressed. And manipulating those emotions to better market products is the sort of thing that's acceptable in the advertising world, even if it sounds pretty horrible. It does sound horrible. You know, right now, we're seeing advertisers try to find people with certain emotions to sell them products. And there have been mailing lists of, of email addresses, of physical addresses, of lonely seniors or people with certain physical disabilities or emotional problems. And, and those are sold as marketing databases. But what you're saying is that maybe these companies will make people have these feelings and then sell them something. Well, that's the next step. The question is, can you personalize it? Yeah. And how much personalization is allowed? Turns out you are more susceptible to advertising when it's spoken by somebody who looks like you. So if I can find, <laughs> not making this up, someone whose face is similar to yours, you will be more susceptible to advertising when you're looking at that face. Good enough for her, then it must be good enough for me. There are experiments that have been done where a researcher has taken a, a picture of your face and morphed it with another face to create a new face that you don't recognize, that looks like you, but you don't realize it. And you are more likely to buy the advertising when the ad is attached to that face. Is that acceptable? Could somebody do that for an advertisement that you see on the web? Could they do it for personal television advertisement? Right? Your face is out there. Right? Facebook has a picture of you. They could morph with a, another face to make this third face, and you're more susceptible to the advertising. That's manipulative, but is that okay? There's no law against that. There's no law against creepiness. There's no law against creepiness, oddly enough. But should there be a law against creepiness? I mean, you know all this. You know way more than we do. And what do you think? I think we need some laws against deliberate psychological manipulation. So I don't know if you remember in the 70s, there was something called subliminal seduction. It's hard to know if this was real or if this was fake. Wait, was that like in a Disney movie where there's one flash of a penis? Like one, like Close one? Close to that. Okay. Or, but, or there were these images that you'd see in ice cubes if you look closely. <laughs> and it's hard to tell if people were imagining this, but it was a thing. Camel cigarettes. Camel cigarettes and, and uh, bourbon and scotch. And Congress passed a law outlawing the practice. Someone said this is just too far, that this is simply too manipulative. And there are going to be some lines on the internet. There are going to be some lines with personalization. But here's the difference, right? So if we're talking about, you know, camel cigarettes seems to be the one that's sticking in my mind. In the 70s, whatever, I'm walking down the street, there's billboards. It's kind of like when I go to the checkout counter, there's the camel cigarettes. Advertisements are everywhere. Facebook, I mean, right? The answer is, well, then just don't do Facebook, isn't it? Do you do Facebook? I don't, but I'm a freak. I don't think you can tell a teenager today not to use Facebook or maybe Facebook's passe, whatever it is they're yeah. using. It becomes a fabric of your life. And yes, you can choose to opt out. You can not use Facebook. You can not use Google. You can – you know, live in a tree and, you know, eat nuts and make your own power. But it's really not the way we live. It's hard for me to recommend people to unplug that way yeah. because it is so drastic. It is certainly an answer, but it can't be the answer. I think you've spelled it out brilliantly, but so many of us, I think, also feel like listener Sabrina Frazier. She left us a message. She's from Little Rock, Arkansas. 
Whenever I hear something related to this topic, I get very frustrated. When I think of the enormity of it all, I just begin to feel helpless. So please tell me, what is the one thing that I can do, that we can do, to affect real change? You know, it's easy to feel helpless. There's just so much data. It's all out there. Everything we do these days involves computers, and computers produce data. I'm holding my cell phone right now, and this fundamentally tracks everywhere I go. It knows when I go to sleep. It knows when I wake up. It knows who I sleep with and who I talk to and what I say. And I think that's why the solutions are not technical. I mean, there are things you can do technically. I can say leave your cell phone at home. I mean, it's good advice, but it's dumb advice. You know, we are forced by society to use these tools. We want to use these tools. We just don't want to be tracked while we use them. And the only way to fix that is going to be legislation. It's going to be rules about what kind of information about us is saved and how it's used. There's really no other way. So answer Sabrina's question. What is the one thing she can do or does she just have to live with this feeling of helplessness? A lot of it is you have to live with it. There are things you can do around the edges. You can encrypt your email, but then you're a weirdo and you can't really send email to people. There are programs you can buy which will help encrypt your web traffic. But this is not going to stop all the corporate tracking and most of the government tracking piggybacks on corporate tracking. So if you're in New York, you probably have a fare card. A metro card that gets you in and out of the subways, probably tied to your credit card. So there's a record of when you enter the subways, what day, what time, what station. Now, you could put cash into a machine and get an anonymous card. That's going to be harder and more annoying. For some systems, you can't even do that. You can't be on Facebook and be anonymous. You probably can have a fake name, but it's going to be pretty easy to attach your real name to it. But I can't help but feel guilty. Like, if I had been a good consumer, I would have read the terms of service and I would have been like, hey, hang on here, wait a second. You're saying that you basically can take all the information about me and do whatever you want with it and hold on to it for perpetuity. Bad consumer, bad consumer. Yeah, it's, it's not our fault. I remember when I first got my iPhone, I remember turning on the first time and thinking, I'm going to read the agreement. And I get to the screen, I'm reading down, and it's a long yeah. page, and it's really boring. Get to the bottom of the page, and it's says, and I'm not joking, page one of 46. And at that point, I said, forget <sighs> it. You can't read these agreements. They're designed to be long. They're designed to be impenetrable. The, the odds are really stacked against us here. Th this isn't really an area where we can be an informed consumer. On the plus side, I think you're telling me, Bruce, that I shouldn't feel so bad about just skipping the terms of service and clicking agree. That's what I do. There are the, only very, very weird people read the terms of service, and they only ever do it once. Okay, so Bruce and I have talked about how to deal or not deal with companies and advertisers. We're going to talk brass tacks about managing the NSA in just a minute. Note to Self is supported by Mozilla, the technology nonprofit that believes every person should be in control of their own privacy on the Internet. Mozilla uses and promotes plain language policies that give people straight talk about their online privacy rights. And Mozilla builds privacy into its own products. Their Firefox browser features a forget button and private browsing with tracking protection. And the new iOS browser, Firefox Focus, is set up for maximum privacy by default. For more, visit mozilla.org slash privacy. Note to Self is supported by Squarespace, the simplest way to create a website. This new year, make your next move with Squarespace. Whether that's starting a business or launching a passion project, no matter what your goals are, Squarespace's award-winning templates can help you present your ideas to the world beautifully. Use offer code NOTE for 10% off your first purchase of a Squarespace domain or website. Squarespace.com. Make your next move. Make your next website. Hey, what's up? I'm Jessica Williams. And I'm Phoebe Robinson. And we are back this spring with an all-new season of our hit podcast, Two Dope Queens, from WNYC Studios. It's comedy. It's conversation with your fave celebs. It's me and Jess telling tribe stories about my bottle obsession. Ugh, gross, dude. Why are you even bringing that up right now? Anyway, this season you'll hear from John Hamm, Carrie Brownstein, Tim Notaro, Gabriel Union, and more. Ooh, my pits are sweating just thinking about Pull it. Pull down, girl. Come on over to Two Dope Queens wherever you get your podcast. And Bono, call me.
We're back. I'm Anoush Samarodi. You're listening to Note to Self, and we're talking to security guru Bruce Schneier about surveillance and why it matters. Okay, I want to talk about the NSA a little bit. We've got a question from listener David Scotty in New York. He wrote us, we all know the NSA can see anything and everything. What I'm mostly concerned with is what can they do with this information that will hurt me, the little guy? I'm not a hacker nor a terrorist. We don't really know what the NSA does with this data. You know, in the end, it's going to be do you trust your government? For most people, this data is not going to be used. It will be used for people on the fringes of society. You know, it, it, is, it is used against Muslim Americans. It is used against black Americans. It's used in the drug war. We're not at the point where there's wholesale surveillance against speech and organization like there is in a country like China. So, I mean, you're sort of sitting here and sort of shrugging as you say this, but surely, I mean, this is what our country is built on is progress, right? That we can continue to not only be a democracy, but lead the way. That's what at least our politicians tell us. I worry about government collection less because I think you or I will be targeted, but simply because of the effects of government collection on freedom, on progress, on ideas, that this notion of ubiquitous surveillance is incredibly chilling. And it, it really means that new ideas won't flourish. And there's an interesting argument here that for us to make progress, we have to be able to try things that we think are wrong. You know, we are on the verge in this country of legalizing marijuana pretty much everywhere, something that would have been amazing to say yeah. five years ago. It's fast, it, isn't it? It, it? It's amazingly fast. But to ha what, what ha has to happen in order for that change to occur is that 20 years ago, someone has to try pot and look around and say, you know, that wasn't that big a deal. And then it takes a generation. It takes 20, 40 years for the old people to die and new people think it's not a big deal to get into power. But eventually there's change. And if you have a system – we are under constant surveillance where nobody could ever try marijuana because they would go to jail. You will never get to a world of legalization. And that means social progress stops. Some of the listeners that we heard from, they're not so nervous about what the NSA is doing now, but what they might be doing in the future. So we have um, uh, John Aprigliano, clip from him. Hi, my name is John. I live in Tampa, Florida. When do you think we will see this data used in the American court system? Thank you. It's an interesting question. We're already seeing some of this data being used, not by the NSA, but by organizations like the FBI. A lot of the tools that the NSA has developed have filtered down to conventional law enforcement. So an example would be Stingray. Stingray is basically a fake cell phone tower that's used to collect both conversations and location data. Uh, we see Stingray data used in courts all the time. It's incredibly secret. But, but it, they didn't even tell – I mean I'm, you're referring to something, a, a methodology that the lawyers, defense lawyers didn't even know existed. So how do we protect ourselves against things like that? Well, you, you, we need the law. I mean this is an example of, of, of this NSA technology filtering down. We now know that, that the DEA – has a very complete uh, surveillance database that they're using. There is a database of license plate capture information being used by different government organizations. So it's less the NSA using the data and more other organizations using either the NSA data or NSA technology recollecting the data. That's what to think about. As to what can, what can change, I worry about, about crises that if the data exists, it begs to be used. And when there's a crisis, people are going to say, use this data. A historical example would be the U.S. Census data in the 40s used to intern Japanese Americans. That data sh was not supposed to be used for that purpose, yeah. but the war happened, crisis happened. Someone said, we have this data, we have to use it. And once you collect the data and save the data, applications will appear. Give me one thing I could do when I walk out of the studio with you. Duck. For real, one thing that I should do. One thing to it, say that, that, that makes me feel like I have a little bit more control over the situation. I think the first thing you have to do is just to be aware. I think a lot of this happens because we're not paying attention. 
And if we understand what's happening, we'll see it and we'll learn to object, to fight, to talk about it. I think just the, the act of, of seeing the surveillance and pointing it out to others is, is an important first step. So you're saying that any listener who made it to the end of our conversation has already gotten a gold star in your book. They're more aware and more knowledgeable. That's certainly true, although if they listen to it on the podcast, everyone knows they listen to it. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Paradox that goes with this. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Bruce Schneier's new book is Data and Goliath, The Hidden Battles to Collect Your Data and Control Your World. Hey, it's Manoush again. Thank you so much for listening to this encore episode of Note to Self. You can talk to us anytime by sending us an email or a voice memo at note to self at WNYC.org. Tell us what you'd like to hear us cover or just reach out and tell us what's on your mind. We're on Twitter and Facebook at Note to Self. And please check out more episodes on iTunes or wherever you like to listen to podcasts or at note to self radio.org. For now, I'm Anoush Samarodi, and I'm either home with a fever, trying to unplug, preparing an amazing episode. Talk soon. Note to Self is supported by Mozilla, the technology nonprofit that believes every person should be in control of their own privacy on the Internet. Mozilla uses and promotes plain language policies that give people straight talk about their online privacy rights. And Mozilla builds privacy into its own products. Their Firefox browser features a forget button and private browsing with tracking protection. And the new iOS browser, Firefox Focus, is set up for maximum privacy by default. For more, visit mozilla.org slash privacy.